Welcome to the Scandinavian Mind podcast. I'm Conrad Olsen, founder and editor-in-chief of Scandinavian Mind. Today we are revisiting a talk from the Transformation Conference, a fashion tech event we hosted together with Uni Communication in Helsinki on May 31st, 2022. In the midst of the most transformative period that fashion has ever seen, we wanted to explore how Finland and Sweden could deepen their impact on the industry together. This talk was titled, How to use creativity to address our challenges. We invited a panel of designers to talk about how they can transform their creativity and radical ideas into commercial successes while keeping an eye on the environment. Speakers were Achilles Ion Gabriel, creative director of Camper, Ellen Hudakova Larson, designer at Hudakova, and Jesse Hudnut, creative consultant and merchant. Moderator was Anne Lyng Jorleen, director at Alpha. The Transformation Conference is a two part event, and the second edition takes place in Stockholm on August 25 during Nordic Fabric Fair. If you want to get an invite to that event, Please make sure you subscribe to our newsletter. Visit scandinavianmind.com slash newsletter. I'd like to thank Helsinki Partners for making this possible. Here now, the panel, how to use creativity to address our challenges. Enjoy. It's not easy to pronounce in any other language than Danish. And I, I head Alpha, which is a support organization and platform for emerging Nordic uh, fashion designers. And I have the honor of moderating this talk, uh, which will explore the uh, translation of creativity into commercial success. And I, uh, with me, I have um, uh, two designers, uh, Ellen hodakova Larsson of Head Hodakova, Swedish label, um, Achilles Jon Gabriel, uh, creative director of Camba and Camba Lab. And last but not least, Jesse Hotnot, our uh, um, experienced spy and creative consultant. I'm very ex- excited to be here with you. Um, we are going to divert slightly from the discussions of the day because we're looking more at the practitioner's uh, role, the creative role of what these guys are, are doing. But for me, um, the balance between creativity and commerciality seems to be at the epicenter of fashion. Um, the crux of staying in business is the ability to um, uh, translate creativity and often radical ideas into commercial success. Um, creativity is in many ways the currency of fashion. Everybody wants it, uh, especially houses hiring talents. Um, Since fashion is associated with newness, um, often for the sake of newness, unfortunately, um, this also implies new ideas, uh, solving problems, finding alternatives. And someone touched upon this earlier today, um, fashion is capitalism in its clearest form, whilst at the same time it also represents hope. It's a new frontier uh, of transformation and also an avant-garde. So, translating creativity into something sellable is no means an easy endeavor, especially not since we are having, you know, this enormous climate change upon us, uh, COVID-19, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, what have you. Um, So, and one thing is how designers, the creatives, are kind of tackling the creative commercial recipe. Uh, Another is how buyers juggle uh, with the same to keeping customers happy and earning money and the whole supply and uh, demand circuit. But I'm so excited to have you all here because you represent different perspectives on on this matter. And I'd like to begin with you, Ellen. Um, I've known you since you graduated from the Swedish School of Textiles in 2019. Um, And after graduation, you were picked up by the Swedish Fashion um, Council's talent program. And uh, I've also known you because you were a finalist on my platform, Alpha. Um, and I, um, so this is, since this is a talk of, on, on creativity and commerciality, I'd like to begin by asking you about your creative process. What sets your creativity in motion? I think, like for me, it's like uh, going into a subject. So for every 
um, for me, the, the creative process is like a magical process, of course, like diving into to something, uh, solving a solution, or f like uh, personally, it's a totally like every design piece is for me like solving a solution and being just in that moment. Uh, and I think that also goes into the subject of um, what is happening around and uh, who I want to be in this industry and why I'm actually running a brand. Mm. So I think that's, that's the whole thing of it. And for me, it's uh, because of the pr process. Um, that's why I'm running it, because it's, it gives me the joy. Uh, but the extension of it is that it is my language. So um, I think that's the, the whole satiety of it. Mm. Just, uh, you know, you said, so who do you want to be in this business? Do you have an answer for that? Um, I don't really know yet, no. but I would say that um, for me it's important to be the creative, uh, even though I'm also the entrepreneur. Um, I think the creative part is so important to to uh, bring up and not only doing it in a commercial way, like driving it towards sales. Uh, I think um, business in the future will be purpose driven uh, and not for the sell. But of course, uh, it's also like paying the rent and everything. But I think the creative part is, is the most important part actually to, to actually make things happen. Mm. Since your work, and I don't know if you're familiar with Huda Kova, but since your work is so based on using existing garments and you have that kind of responsible uh, practice, I, um, I'm curious about what comes first in your creative process, whether it's the existing garments uh, or the collection you plan to make. Is it sort of that you, you look at an object and see how that, can, how that communicates possibilities to you or have you already thought of the collection? Mm, I think... Um uh, it's it's part of uh, me diving into the the garment and actually look at the handicraft that's are made and trying to highlight that. So it's definitely the second, like going into uh, the garment and seeing the possibilities of it. And also my business model is based on being flexible, which means um, that the whole like how 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 many pieces that are made is it's unique pieces, but they are made to to uh, be updated in new type of uh, materials, which is provided by different uh, collaborations that we have. So the different co collaborations are providing this kind of flexibility within the in the model. Right. And Achilles, um, being the creative director at, at Camber and Camber Lab, which is Camber's more progressive sock brand, uh, uh, known for its collaborations as well, I'm also interested in just, uh, you know, picking your brain about your creati creative process, because I guess it's at the heart of what you do, because you're sort of leading a creative team and you have to come up with ideas or pick peop other people's brains for their ideas. Um, so what sets your creativity in motion? Mm. I think, um, I mean, after a while ago when it started, I never really switched it off anyway. So it's ongoing thing, like observing everything that happens, um, all the cliches that all the designers do, like, you know, you go to art exhibition or you see a movie or look at people at the street. Um, but it's a lot of observing what happens. And I mean, it can be even news. I mean, it doesn't have to be something cultural. Um, so I would say like somewhere there. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm. I think it's fair to say that your work is bold and slightly off kilter and Camber is this big shoe institution and I think since you arrived there you really revamped um, its sort of signature and its style and it's become cool. Um, but I'd like to know uh, in which way has working for big company changed the way that you work creatively or perhaps put it in a different way how have you changed Camber? <laughs> um, yeah, well, how has the work changed? Um, well, when I had my own brand or I was consulting for other brands, I was really designing. And now, um, I mean, 
mostly I sit from nine to six in uh, meetings and uh, board meetings and committees, which is not the most exciting sometimes. <laughs> but um, yeah, of course, um, e even though I'm not really drawing the shoes anymore, but I'm still I'm directing the designers. Um, so it's really, I mean, everything comes from me, but I just don't do that stage anymore. So it's that, that's maybe the biggest change. Do you miss it? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> In what way? Well, it's, it's really nice to like, um, I don't know, just draw, but mm -hmm. I don't remember last time I draw something. <laughs> so um, since this is a talk about the translation of creativity into the commercial recipe, uh, how, how do you work with the, those two? I mean, is your creative process separate from your thoughts about the consumers and how the products speak to them? Mm. Well, it's it's very different approach when talk about Camper or Camper Lab. Camper is obviously a lot more commercial, like very commercial brand. So there, I think about all the time, like, is it this for our customers, for the clientele, the issues we are doing right now, um, or in the future? And I mean, of course, we need to push um, the boundaries because the um, customers, the clients, what are we calling them, consumers? Uh, also, their taste evolves, so we can't stay still, but. For me, it's super important that I keep really the camper DNA. That when I started, I thought it was a little bit fading away. So my first thing was like, okay, the brand is Mallorca, so we have to make sure that uh, more people would understand we are from a small island in Spain, and also to bring back the DNA that um, I thought it was starting to uh, fade away. And, um, mm -hmm. and we have insanely. Um, uh, uh, insane archive with like all the styles ever since we started 1975 it's all archived and I go there like before every starting every season to check like okay do we bring something back um, I mean not as it is but as a version um, and then Camper Lab um, there I'm very free like when I started I first started with Camper Lab and later Camper so um, with Camper, I only kept the name, but I kind of changed how it's spelled a little bit, so I changed everything. <laughs> <laughs> For Camper, I didn't do that. <laughs> Great. And Jesse, um, you worked as a buying director for this retail institution opening ceremony. Everybody knows it. And uh, you also have been a commercial consultant to GmbH and Ekaslata, advisor to Maiden Name, and now uh, the Swedish brand uh, Très Bien, which are all very cool labels. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really interested in buying, uh, in, not in buying, I'm interested in bringing your buying perspective into this conversation, sort of the thought process behind obviously the risk calculation uh, behind yeah. buying and the drive to find new designers. And also, it seems to me that buyers, in a way, hold the key to commercial success for designers. Mm. Do you agree? I think that uh, designers and the ones who support them hold the keys to their own success. Um, in some ways, yes, retail companies and buyers are gatekeepers to that success. Um, however, you know, in order to have a sound business, I think, you know, uh, it's not just the buyer who's making that decision for you. So, um, in terms of what you're talking about, about the, the, the taking on a risk as a buyer, bringing on a new brand, there's many things to, um, to keep in mind aside from just how the brand looks, who likes it, um, whether it's on trend. Uh, there's, you know, and it's been difficult in the pandemic seeing new brands virtually because a lot of that has to do with just the feel that you get um, from in-person meetings, understanding um, where the brand has come from, where their goals are uh, to go down the line. So it's many different factors and I think sometimes you know it when you see it. Um, you're willing to maybe take a small risk and then hope that that pays off into that person becoming, uh, you know, the creative director of a bigger house down the line, let's say, or really building their own business. But to go back to the beginning of your question, I really do think more and more brands have to speak directly to customers rather than the buyer being this integral part of putting them on a platform. Um, it, it's one ingredient to success, but I think 
uh, brands speaking directly to their own customers is becoming increasingly important. Mm. So as an advisor and, and a buyer to a sort of uh, designers and labels that mm. trade more in perhaps, can we say, experimental, um, 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 daring aesthetic, how do you help these designers like Ellen, uh, who's sort of an uh, early career designer establishing yeah. her own label, how do you help them gain commercial success? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's different from designer to designer, um, but there is an aspect of, you know, when you meet so many different small businesses, designers working um, in our field, you start to, yeah, I think it, it, it's kind of about coming in and translating that overall beautiful vision into the practical aspect of presenting it in a showroom environment. So. Um, ensuring that there's the right balance of both commercial and creative or that the creative um, styles can lead into more commercial styles and even just something as basic as how do we show this? Um, mm. how, how do we set ourselves up for success? What does the showroom look like? Where is it going to be? Which buyers are we going to approach? There's so many other variables to consider aside from um, creating an inspirational collection. Mm. I agree, and I think also there seems to be this underlying understanding that the creative and the commercial are two separate entities when in fact they're not, because they're so integral to this industry. And I, I think it's fair to say that the aesthetic and cultural value of fashion is so, it cannot be separated from its economic value in a sense, that, that, that they go hand in hand. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a way in which you can be entrepreneurially creative. Um, you know, you can stage your show in an unexpected way or disrupt how... Um, typically brands might show uh, their collections in order to acquire customers in a different way or gain the attention of the industry. So um, it's really fun to work with designers who have that ambition um, and that sort of know-how of approaching not only creating their designs, but creating their business uh, in a way which kind of evolves beyond maybe where we're at right now. Mm. And I, lo I love working with brands who do that. Mm. So, Ellen, just going back to you, you, you are new in, in this business. You established your label in 2021 in Stockholm, and you already secured financial backing, which is uh, such a, a great uh, thing to do so soon. Um, but I also know it's so hardcore running one's own business as a startup, uh, especially as your pieces are one-off pieces, and most of them are created in-house by your small team. Um, and as a designer, you are taught at school how to be creative, but you're not necessarily, or you aren't taught how to run a business. Uh, and many young designers struggle with exactly that. So I, I'm curious, uh, what do you know now, two years down the road, that you didn't know when you started out, and what do you wish you had known? <laughs> mm, I think the entrepreneurial part is definitely mm -hmm. the... I, I didn't know that I was enjoying the entrepreneurial part that much. Um, but I think that comes with my personality of uh, this problem-solving thing. Um, uh, so it's an extension of like who I am, not uh, creatively, but also like uh, working with strategy, uh, which like evolves and de develops and ev evolves me as a person. And I think uh, being like I, I'm brought up in a horse farm and the only thing you do when you're when you're competing with the horses is analyzing why you didn't win you know mm -hmm. so it's like part of mm. it's like part of the DNA of mine uh, which is I think brought into this kind of word instead so I'm analyzing like how I can do better or how I can understand better to um, evolve in different ways mm -hmm. um, and I think that was like this entrepreneurial part which is like 90% of, of running a brand or um, being the designer of the of the um, yeah your own brand is uh, definitely something that I wasn't planning on but I think this entrepreneurial part is so important to actually uh, like get your work out and I mean it needs to be purposeful in every way. And you're now stocked at Selfridges, which is a huge seal of approval in terms of getting somewhere with, yeah. you know, a, a retailer. Uh, has that, has, was that a turning point for you in like, okay, aha, I'm onto something? Was this, did this, this mark a sort of, a, a, well, did you acknowledge that you were on the road to success? Or is that yet to come? 
Um, I think we this year has been, um, or as I said, like the strategic work for me is very important because I need to make the right choices uh, for me. Uh, and I mean, it's for me in a way like building my own path. So I need to be very uh, selective of what I choose and where I want to be shown. Uh, which is, um, I think, when we got the suffragists at, at the first stage, I think that was uh, just, of course, this um, uh, new stage of fixing all of the production work uh, because we're working. My company is like working in in the other uh, in the other way than it normally does. So, it normally you design and then you uh, create it. Um, and we get uh, the questions like uh, this um, we uh, from the collaborations we have um, we get questions if we want this stock of of anything and then we uh, make a choice if we can create uh, of that and then we create so it's the opposite of what it normally is mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, solving this production part in another way because it's like deconstructing the whole garment uh, and that is another system than the normal production system mm -hmm. which has been a part, definitely a turning point like understanding how we want to create this kind of environment for us but also for the factory or manufacturers. Mm. I'm curious how you approach that challenge uh, working with a bigger retailer where there might be actually more demand than you're able to supply. Um, is that something that you work through consciously with your retail clients where you sort of limit the amount? Or, I mean, how do you kind of manage that? Because I find that in a lot of small brands where there might be a demand from a store that's higher than maybe they can produce in a given season. Mm. And maybe they don't want to produce that much in the uh, for various reasons. Yeah. Like, is that something that you've run into? Yeah, and we can produce that much. So we're we're we have a limit, and that is that, yeah. which makes it unique. And then yeah. you also see the price of it because it's such a handicraft of doing this. Right, right. But it also to value the handicraft that was before, mm -hmm. like just making a belt out of uh, like four layers of leather or making. Uh, a shirt or yeah. a suit. It's a lot of handicraft worked in it, but then we deconstruct it, which is another like process of it. Uh, so when we get when we have like a limited pieces of say twenty, then there is only twenty. Mm -hmm. So the market is like, uh, okay, we need five, we need ten. How many? And then we need to say stop, and then we can like uh, have the same design, but we can. Um, we can um, have it in, in, in another material. Yeah. Like instead of jeans, it's going to be like um, mm. just yeah. camo or whatever. Sorry. Just to bring Achilles into the conversation <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, because you were once in Ellen Shoes. You were once, a, you know, you ran your eponymous label and I've followed mm -hmm. your work since the beginning. And, and many young designers struggle, you know, exactly with that, that they have plenty of media attention and uh, cultural capsule and coolness, but succeeding commercially is a completely different ball game. How has, do you remember, do you remember that journey? How was that for you back in the days <laughs> before you were... A big shot at Canva. Um, well, yeah, my first collection, I, I had just moved from uh, Helsinki to Paris. Um, I did my collection, I didn't think about anything. Um, I was only concentrated really on the shoes and the collection. And I rented this really small space and I was like, damn, I don't have any pictures of the shoes. So I'm going to send the drawings of the shoes to buyers and that's it and the info. Um, and then I think it was L LNCC, the first one who came in, yeah. like this like uh, five skater dude looking guys. Um, I was like, okay, I really need a cigarette, but guys, you can take a look, don't steal anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I went for a cigarette and I came back. I was like, okay, can we have a line sheet? And I'm like, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love this. <laughs> um, and they're like, um, okay, um, John, John Skelton, the, um, who was running LNC? He's like, okay, I'll draw you a line set. Can you tell me the price? I'm like, oh fuck, I didn't think about the price. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I guess you need to like 
<laughs> be open and learn all the time. But did uh, you land the LNCC? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they ordered an insane focused. amount. I was like, okay. That's pretty awesome. And I was being like, okay, let's close the showroom. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, has obviously it sounds as if that, that you've learned a thing or two since. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I know what line sheet is. <laughs> so, has being at Camper taught you more in terms of uh, uniting the commercial and the creative? Yeah, like now I have to be on this go-to-market and what else committees and like they keep on throwing this CRM, KPI things that I, <laughs> before Camper I had no idea what it is. And I mean, in the beginning, I was just Googling in a meeting, like, okay, with CRM, um, okay, that's that, keep it, all right. But they would be already on the next slide. <laughs> I love so, this honesty. <laughs> so, um, yeah, then I was like, oh, damn, I really have to study a little bit of this that I can keep up with the rest of the directors. <laughs> Great. Now I can. <laughs> now you can. Also, I mean, creativity, as we were talking about, is solving problems, and there is a huge problem in the industry which has been addressed already by now. So let's just uh, spend the last couple of minutes that we have talking about responsibility and sustainable action or whatever we can call it. Um, and Jesse, designers uh, like these fine people play an important role in showing new avenues uh, for representation, diversity, and bringing responsible practices into the industry. Uh, and there's obviously much debate about this so-called systemic change that is needed um, and responsible solution often go hand in hand with these creative uh, practices and I think we would uh, we learned earlier that this is something from Frederick that consumers are also demanding um, this change but do you think from your point of view that they're willing to pay for it or perhaps put it in a more uh, direct way uh, is there money to be made in responsible fashion I think so. I think that it's the. W I think fashion is moving forward, as we know, all the time, very quickly. Um, I mean, something Ellen was saying that I found really interesting and sort of sparked an idea is that we're kind of coming. It, it feels modern to do things in a slower way nowadays. So, you think of brands like Bodhi from New York, um, and. And, and many other brands that are using dead stock fabrics or kind of going back to a handicraft way of making things that are super special. I mean, it's almost like an old school luxury approach, but it feels modern because there isn't an, an aspect of sustainability there. I think, you know, in my work, um, meeting with a lot of designers, scouting new talent, it's definitely a concern. I think that there's initiatives at all the big retail companies, um, and for me personally, I think I just connect with creatives, designers, businesses who have shared values with, with me and the types of consumers that I'm thinking about when I buy a brand. Um, so in that way, I think that moving forward, there's absolutely opportunity in this space for people to both make money and consider a more responsible way of doing it. Mm. In other businesses, there, there have been disruptions uh, in the entire field. For instance, the car industry with mm. the electrical vehicle and, and, and Tesla's different approach to production. And I'm curious whether there's been this disruption taking place in retail. Is that yet to come and what would it be? Yeah, I mean, I wish I knew that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, would be, it would be good to know that because uh, I'd probably make some investments. But um, <laughs> Me too. No, I mean, even just being here today has been so inspirational and hearing about new textiles and possibilities of using recycled garments. But in terms of retail, I mean, you know, there's a way in which I think e-commerce is flattening everything. Um, everything is available. There's so much availability. Um, there's so many ways for us as independent people, small businesses, medium-sized businesses to create our own e-commerce companies. So I think the future of retail in some ways is obviously online and it's a way in which how do we sift through how much there is because it's just there's, there's more and more and more and going back to some of Alex's points around, you know, intentionally consuming and consuming less and being really enjoying so much um, when we do do it in an intentional way. like what are the tools that we'll have to be able to navigate this like massive stream of, of, of products. Um, mm. So I think it, it, it's about the way in which we are able to filter 
all of the stuff that's out mm -hmm. there um, and hopefully land on the things that are more responsible. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's probably the way that we're going to have to navigate this going forward. Campa is very invested in, you know, positive impact and, and, and change. And it's been such a, as from what I can read, it's integrated into every grain of the company and every uh, process uh, from using plant-based materials, seaweed and wood pulp and re reducing waste and so on. Um, how have you, as, a, a as the creative director at Canva, uh, integrated responsibility into the creative process of the company? <coughs> um, well, I mean, the easiest way, that, that's where I started first, was um, to change the materials we use. It was, I think, like uh, better materials. We were using 6% before I joined, and now I think we're at 95%. Because mm -hmm. there are some things that is re we choose, because it's so many different materials put together, uh, there is quite often glue, not on every shoe, but um, working hard on that too. Um, like so many different materials put together. So I mean, even to take it apart is um, is not easy. Um, but yeah, um, uh, we're working really hard at the moment also from a project that is a lot more circular, like, um, um, well, in very different levels. We have this one project um, coming that is next autumn that is um, more monomaterial sneaker, but not the aesthetic is very different than what we have seen before. Um, but we managed to do this um, that you can actually recycle the whole shoe. Um, so there is no waste material either, um, a lot less water used, a lot less electricity used. Um, so that one is something I'm really, really proud of, for instance, this project. Then we do other projects like, okay, we try to do a shoe that we only do uh, with um, natural ingredients, or we do a shoe that is only recycled ing ingredients. Um, but we are, we are not really approaching only one way. We try to do as many as possible and see how they go and uh, what is the uh, more final impact. Because we also take shoes back to um, um, that, uh, that we actually destroy the shoes uh, responsibly. Because, I mean, sometimes even I have done it in the past, like, okay, the shoes are dead, I throw it in the trash, and I wasn't even thinking that it shouldn't go to a mixed waste. Mm -hmm. But it's sometimes impossible to take apart. Um, yeah, but we're working quite hard on that. Mm. And now I'm really happy. I'm also, in, not just in a product level, like I think it's going to be soon, we are going to become a B Corp, which is something mm -hmm. we've been working super hard on. It's really hard to get that certificate. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I'm sure this resonates with you, Ellen, because your whole sort of work is so centered on, you know, upcycling uh, using already existing materials. Uh, and yet we talk about scale being sort of a key word in responsible fashion. And is it possible to scale up sustainable fashion? So, um, but I'm, I'm curious, I think we've talked about this before, you and I, but how do you source your materials and where does the production of your work take place? So we have, as I said, like different uh, collaborations with different companies that provides different part of the collection and the production. So um, it's um, this kind of sourcing uh, central for secondhand garments. Um, and there are a big company called Elis who is normally renting out workwear garments or textile in the world generally. Um, so, and uh, we also have like Oscar Jakobsson and Selby and you know like this suit suits and shirts and these kind of companies um, and they provide because um, the whole business model is based on the basic wardrobe so uh, we use like mainly like jeans t-shirts short uh, shirts <laughs> and, and suits um, and that comes from different areas and the quality needs to be good but for, from this kind of second-hand part. And I mean, this is built uh, because of scaling, because shirts is not something that is lacking on the, on the, uh, on the, in the business. So you can get suits and shirts and jeans, like maybe from everywhere mm -hmm. uh, in every other country. Um, so it's based on that to have the possibility to scale. Uh, which is part of us having this kind of stock, but then we do limitations. So the other uh, companies that provides us with their dead stock, they 
uh, come in, uh, as I said before, uh, with a suggestion of, can you do something with this? And then that's part of uh, that collection for that season, or, yeah. So if Conrad allows us to go just a couple of minutes over time, I'd just like to end this uh, session on just looking, or perhaps not looking, but there seems to be this undercurrent of Nordic values that we've just touched on today, but we haven't really dug into it. And I, I, I think there's, I, I, at least I, I would lo like to think there is this undercurrent of Nordic values in what you guys are doing. Obviously, you, you are the only non-Nordic member of, of this panel. Uh, um, and I, I, as a Finn, just going back to you, Achilles, working for a Mallorcan label, I'm curious whether you engage uh, fi your Finnish background in your work or whether you believe there is a specific set of Finnish values that inform your approach to shoemaking. Um, for sure. I don't really actively think about it, but I grew up here. I think I was like 22 when I moved away, so obviously I'm like very... Um, <coughs> Um, very much Finnish person, even if I've been, I don't know, 10 years in Paris in between and now in Mallorca. But um, yeah, I guess it's um, really the values I learned here and brought that um, to, um, for instance, now at Camper. Um, yeah, in, in, mm. in some way, I mean, not mm. the working hours. <laughs> <laughs> not the working hours. <laughs> it's not four days a week. <laughs> I'm also curious, Ellen, because at least to Dane, um, when looking at Sweden, there seems to be this Swedish legacy in playing a, a sort of a global role in wanting to improve the world by a better, leading by the better example. And, and, uh, and I wonder if that's something that unconsciously, with your uh, responsible practice, that you, 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 uh, you think about the Swedishness in your work. I think I'm uh, just like oh I'm just a horse girl <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, trying to mirror like put the mirror up to the mother nature uh, but also to the like put the mirror to the consumer or the viewer mm, mm. And, the, and the same <laughs> question to you Jesse obviously you are a non-nordic member of the panel but I'm still curious about your perspective yeah uh, and and so from looking at it from your outsider perspective is there anything that resonates that all the panels have addressed today that you feel oh that's distinctively Nordic to you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, working with Trivian, which is a Swedish-based company for now almost six years, um, and having the privilege of traveling here quite a bit um, for fashion stuff. Yeah, I think today um, it's, it's just there's a level of care and concern and thoughtfulness that you, that you, that you have here. Um, I, I also think, you know, in, in America and other places um, who are perhaps way more responsible for the climate crisis, it's just such a, there's so much division and polarization around the topic. So to be able to have um, constructive dialogue around actually fixing it, can you can't even get there, you know, because people disagree on whether it's even real, which is absurd, which is totally absurd. But um, being here and, and observing more how people accept it it's a challenge and we want to try and fix it, even if it means in our own communities or our, our relatively small countries and leading by example, I think is inspirational. And, and I think, um, you know, that's, that's a great thing to, you know, be able to show the rest of the world. So on that note, Jesse, Ellen and Achilles, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your insights with us. Thank you. Thanks. That was an outtake from the Transformation Conference in Helsinki in May of 2022. The Transformation Conference is a two-part event and the second edition takes place in Stockholm on August 25, 2022 during Nordic Fabric Fair. If you want to get an invite to that event, please make sure you to subscribe to our newsletter. Visit scandinavianmind.com newsletter. Until next time, goodbye.